Hello folks. Well, this is take three of this video. Maybe I'll get it right this time. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, we are right in the middle of Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter. Today we're looking at verses 13 through 28. In this first section, our author writes about the homeland of the faithful in verses 13 through 16. And here, the author is talking about the Christian's true home. He says that until we arrive there, we are just wanderers in a foreign territory. Now, he brings the patriarchs into this discussion because he says that through the eye of faith, the patriarchs had seen the working out of God's promise to bless the world through them, and they themselves confessed that they too were strangers and foreigners on the earth. This proved to the author that men like this were conscious that they had no real place on the earth. And this is where we are as well, right? We too are conscious that we, we don't belong to this earth. And like the patriarchs, we seek a homeland. A homeland is one's native country. It's the place of one's origin. And how often do we need to be reminded of this, which the patriarchs themselves understood that our homeland, our native country, our place of origin is not here. It's in another, well, another realm and another life. On earth, those patriarchs set their hopes and aspirations on heaven. And then he concludes the section by saying that men like this, the author wishes to stress, God does not blush to acknowledge. I love that thought. God is eager to acknowledge us as his sons and daughters when we have this perspective that we long to be home with him. Then in the next section, our author wants to talk about the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph in verses 17 through 22. This section begins with that wonderful story of Abraham offering up his son Isaac, just as God commanded him to do. What an act of faith that was. I can't even imagine uh, being commanded to offer up one of my children to God and then having the faith to carry it out. Of course, the brilliance of this faith is that in all of this, Abraham left it up to God. You say, what did he leave up to God? He left up to God how God would carry out his plan. It was God's plan. It was God's promise that he would bless all the nations of the earth through Abraham's seed. And it was God's problem. That is, if Abraham offers up his only son, it would be God's problem to make good on his promise. Well, God commanded Abraham to do that, and Abraham would obey. That's all that Abraham considered. What? He reasoned that God would raise the dead rather than allow one iota of his word to fail. And in essence, figuratively speaking, that's what happened. He did raise him up from the dead and gave him back his son and his plan and his promise still are foolproof. Then we have the examples of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, who, as they approached death, looked in faith to things as yet unseen. I like that thought, too. Seeing the unseen. That's what faith allows us to do, by the way. And the examples of Isaac and Jacob and Joseph encourage us that we can do this. As we approach the end of our lives, we can look to the things that we cannot yet see, but know that they are real. Well, in verses 23 through 28, we read about the faith of Moses. And all of these, of course, were great characters in Jewish history, uh, men and women who would be respected by the readers of Hebrews, the original readers. Before we talk about Moses' faith, though, we read about the faith of his parents. This faith allowed them to perceive in the appearance of the child a token of God's distinctive purpose for him in regard to the nation of Israel. Somehow they, by faith, saw in this boy the hope of Israel. Then we read about Moses, who chose rather to share the ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses realized he could not be both an Egyptian and an Israelite. And he saw, he saw something by faith. What did he see? He saw that the pleasures of sin give no lasting satisfaction. Verse 26 is an important one 
for the original readers of this epistle. The author is sure that abuse is always associated with Christ, that to be a Christian is even to expect such abuse, and he is sure, as he looks at the life of Moses, that it has always been that way. The readers need to keep this in mind, that whatever abuse they are called upon to suffer, it is suffering for Christ and in his behalf. And how is Moses able to do this? How is he able to choose to suffer ill treatment with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin? He's able to do it because he is aware of true values. Verse 26, he looked to the reward. I like that. There's value in looking to our eternal reward because it allows us to see by faith what really has value and what doesn't have value. The author says it was faith in Moses' heart that caused him to leave Egypt. And I believe the leaving Egypt is a reference to going to Midian. Right. This is not the exodus uh, as Moses leads the people out of Egypt. This is rather his going to Midian. Remember he killed someone. He killed an Egyptian taskmaster in Egypt and he ran for his life. Uh, I think talking about Midian here it keeps these verses in chronological order. So when he leaves Egypt, he naturally feared for his own safety, as the Exodus record says. But concerning his choice to serve God rather than Pharaoh, he had no fear. He did that by faith. And this is how the author can write that he left Egypt by faith. And in that 40-year period in Midian, by faith, he knew that God had a plan for him to deliver Israel. By faith, the author tells us, he also observed the Passover as Israel is on their way out of Egypt and he observed the sprinkling of blood on the doorpost that saved the firstborn. And by the way, friends, I really think here is a reminder of the importance of careful obedience. Careful obedience. I think it's a message that we need to hear today. Obedience is still highly valued by God and should be highly valued by us. My point here is that Moses did something in a very small thing. He painted that blood of the lamb on the doorpost. He painted that blood there. It was a very small thing, but it was an act of obedience. And that careful obedience to that divine command was the only means of escape from the oncoming destruction of the destroyer. I'm glad that Moses obeyed. I think there's a lesson there for us, too, that we need to obey God, even in things that we might consider trivial. Okay, I'm getting into application. What are we going to take from this text? Well, number one, let's trust in God. Let's be faithful and loyal to him. And what will that faithfulness look like? Try these things on for size. Faith in God will look like this. We will live on this earth as wanderers, sojourners, knowing that our native country is in heaven. We know that we cannot be children of God and children of this world. Faith in God looks like this. We will obey God no matter what he commands. How can we do so? Because we trust that he will work out his plans one way or another. Our task is just to obey what he says. What does faith look like? This faithfulness looks like this. We will willingly suffer for Christ. And how can we do so? Because we are looking to the reward at the end of the road. And faith in God looks like this. We will believe in the unseen, just as Joseph and Isaac and Jacob did. And we will put our faith in what we cannot see with the physical eye. And faithfulness looks like this. We will choose to serve God rather than the gods of this world. Take your pick on those application lessons. The lessons to apply in this text are numerous. <laughs> it's just a wonderful text. And it encourages, us, it encourages us all to place our trust in God. Uh, trust in God has proven to be the best way to course. Just look at the lives of these patriarchs. Look at the life of Moses and his parents. All of these great men and women of the Old Testament whose trust in God was rewarded. And that's the message 
that this writer wants us to see in this text. Okay, I've talked way too much for today, haven't I? I'll see you again at our next uh, video, and we're going to be closing out Hebrews chapter 11 on our next video, aren't we? Hey, God bless you in your reading of this wonderful word.